SAFM. You strike a woman, you strike a rock. I wanna leave my footprints on the sands of time. August is Women's Month, and SAFM is celebrating all the great women who have shaped South Africa into becoming the great country it is today. Winnie Matigizela Mandela. Watinta Bafazi, Watinta Bogoto. My guest today is most famously known for her role as Speaker of Parliament. But some of the political positions that she's held also include being the national spokesperson of the ANC, as well as the Secretary General of the ANC's Women's League, as well as being Deputy President of South Africa. Balekambete, another second. If you want to know more, Google her, baby. But now, thank you very much, Mama, for your time. I truly appreciate it. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor. What was your day like today? I was chairing a meeting from about 11 until when I came here in Lutuli House. Mm. Mm. What was uh, your morning routine? Take me through that. Well, since I retired, Unless I'm going to one of the schools of my grandchildren to be one of the grandparents' uh, <laughs> participants, which is something that is new and wonderful. I just lie in and read my book, get my coffee, until I feel I, I want to get up, unless I'm going to have a meeting. How are you faring with that? Because, you know, one of the, the articles that I came across... Um, had quoted you saying a few months ago, I think it was before the elections, that you were quite anxious about your future. Are you still anxious? No. I'm enjoying every bit of it. Yeah. Just to wake up in my bedroom, turn around, see my husband, <laughs> look ahead, <laughs> see the beautiful view yeah. from our house. Mm. And I just enjoy those moments of a morning when I'm not rushing mm. to an early morning meeting, I have to go and check. You know, you've got me looking forward to retirement. Ah, so, I tell you, but of course there is work to do. Of course, I mean, with someone like you, the work never ends. You know, it doesn't. Hey, now, yes. one of the things that I didn't mention in your very lengthy profile is the fact that you were a teacher at one point. Yes. Now, this is quite interesting because one of the people, one of the questions that I retweeted, you can go to uh, my page at Masachabandlovo. Tons of people have been tweeting me questions, and one of them was from a gentleman who wanted to know, because he actually felt quite sorry for you, because he felt like your job as Speaker of Parliament entailed you disciplining grown-ups. And I just want to know, to what extent did your job as a teacher actually prepare you for your position as Speaker of Parliament? Maybe to some extent prepared for the job of doing political work. Because broadly speaking, uh, you've got to be ready to say something, you know, in politics. <coughs> sure, we're just going to give you a second to just take a sip of your water. But for those of you who have just tuned in, that is the voice of Mepale Kambete, who is enjoying her retirement and looking really, really good, really relaxed, and enjoying her time as a grandmother. Um, for once, as I can imagine, in your, <laughs> in your life, <laughs> you were saying. Yeah, I was saying, you know, as a teacher, you, you learn to stand in front of people and s deliver a message, say something, give direction, you know, give information, give guidance in a classroom. So th those are some of the ways in which I, you find yourself in politics also having to do some similar uh, mannerisms, gestures, but of course within a different context. Sure, gotcha. You know, because you are dealing with adults, you are dealing with very big issues facing countries, facing people's lives, worrying about the extent to which we are all doing the things that we have promised our people we are doing. I must say, at some point, I also felt Is quite sorry for you. That stands out for you. For me, it's that first occasion I was faced with uh, 
the kind of attitude and intransigence and something we had never experienced in Parliament up to that, that time. Uh, when there was that demonstration of uh, pay back the money. Mm, with the EFF. Yes, yeah. it was the first time and I really, in, and in fact the media quoted me saying I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel like you lost it? Oh yeah, I did. <laughs> I lost it. <laughs> How could you not? <laughs> How could I not? I'm only a human being. Right. Because some of these things were unheard of. Mm. You know, I've yeah. been in parliament from the first parliament of the democratic uh, South Africa since uh, uh, Nelson Mandela was, you know, led us into democracy. Yeah. There were norms, there were certain codes of conduct, there were certain ways we related to one another that were unspoken even, you know, as political parties. We all have come out of an election campaign where we all attracted the attention of our voters. We all tried our best to sell the manifestos of our parties, various political parties, and persuaded our people to believe in us. Right. And then, of course, the IEC declares the results, okay? Mm. So, so many of you are here from this political party and all of it. We've, we've been, all of us as South Africa, as a society, you know, developing in our understanding of how to handle this and what happens. And there were always codes that were unspoken, that were, we never argued about. Right. The way we relate to one another. Now, with that said, I'd love to know what your sentiments are, especially sitting where you are sitting now, retired, mm -hmm. but looking back at this, uh, in, I, I say, for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. new reality, this mm -hmm. new disruptive style of conversation in Parliament. What are your true sentiments around the direction? My true sentiments are, yes, there is the, the reality that it brought more attention to Parliament as, as, a, as a place where we do our work, where maybe it was boring and nobody really took it. <laughs> notice but of course we knew just how serious the yeah. work we were doing was sure we've always known so more people now pay attention because of the drama that has been there in the fifth term so if there's anything that has come out of it it is that but what i regret is the conduct that we have displayed including to our younger South Africans who are growing up, some of whom have been heard, we are told, mm -hmm. quoting this way of engaging with your seniors, with your adults, with your parents, and thinking, wow, maybe it's the way to do things. Right, I got you, mm -hmm. I got you, sure. Now, there's, there are so many more questions I'd love to ask you about um, moments in your political life. But right now, I want to get to know you a bit more. Mm. So, for those of you who may not know your personal b background, where were you born? I was actually born in Durban, in Claremont Township. When did the political bug first bite? I was not very conscious of it because I was born into a community and an environment as well as a family where politics was just, you know. The order of the day. The air we were breathing. Yeah. You know, so you don't remember a moment when you took a decision to join politics. It was your reaction to the environment. It's what was happening that then just indicated to you how you must respond, where you must go, with who you must relate. And uh, as young people, the ANC was banned. There we were, we got together, and uh, these were the elements of the environment in which we became conscious without anybody coming to tell us right. 
and ask us whether we don't want to join. Julie was a year and three months old and uh, my mom remained with them. Wow, wow. Know, because I had to make a decision on getting an indication from my brother and other people who were behind bars here in Johannesburg that it's time for you to go. It, it must have been really, really difficult being a young woman living out in a foreign country. Um, talk to us about the challenges of specifically being a female in exile. For me, being a female in exile had the difficulty in particular of motherhood. Motherhood of very young children. And I used to see kids of the ages of my own babies around me in the home I was then taken to when I got to Swaziland. And the ANC had made arrangements for me to join a particular family. And they had a baby exactly the age of Nguli and another one exactly the age of my boy who was four months old. So that was the most painful part of arriving in exile. Wow. This is Me Bale Kambete. She joins me as we celebrate her, her journey. Continue to celebrate excellence. excellence. And in studio, I'm joined by Bale Kambete. And uh, we're just having a conversation, getting to know her and what it is that makes this powerhouse tick. Mama, um, what would you say is the most single most hurdle you've had to overcome in your life? And what lesson did you take from it? It's the hurdle about the kind of sacrifices you've got to make when you get into the kind of life we choose in response to the, the challenges of the times. Because you, there's something you've got to sacrifice in your personal in particular family life. Mm, 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 so mm. that was the biggest sacrifice and the biggest difficulty, therefore, yeah. as a human being in general, but as a mother, as a woman in particular. So our lives have not been the general normal lives of couples, families, right. you know, uh, you spend a lot of time away from your children who are growing up, whom you need to be guiding through certain moments. I remember when we were at the World Trade Center negotiating towards even the interim constitution. You would arrive at home early in the morning, wake the kids up, make sure they are getting you know, ready to go to school and you are getting ready yourself to go back to those negotiations. Mm -hmm. That was very mm -hmm. abnormal. Mm -hmm. We went through times of that nature. I'm glad you can finally enjoy your grandkids. If, if, if hopefully that makes up for it, then yeah. you absolutely deserve it. Boiti Bell on Twitter says, my question for Me Baleka is, life can sometimes be pretty tough and it's difficult to keep going and to stay positive. She wants to know if you have any motivational tips. Do you have a mantra that you find useful that you can share with everyone who's listening? The one thing I always say to people is stay calm. Of course I lost it. That day. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were allowed. We gave you a pass. No, I think anyone would have lost it that day. <laughs> that stay day, calm. Stay, <laughs> but in general, uh -huh. I tell, I was talking to my boy the other day, Duma, Stay calm. Doesn't matter how much a person is testing you. Generally, try and stay calm, even as you interact with them and as you engage with the situation. Stay calm. So, 25 years into democracy, your personal view is South okay. Africa ready for a female president? I don't think so. You don't think so? I think, regrettably, South Africa has proved it's not ready, psychologically. What do you mean? I think there are lots of women who are ready, who are great, who are even better qualitatively than many male leaders. But South Africa 
is extremely unready. What makes you say that? I'm saying that because South Africa believes women are not the type of people who must be leaders. Mm -hmm. And yet they see them doing great things, doing things that show what great people and what great leaders they are, but they choose to believe otherwise. Do you think that's coming from the men? Or it's, coming it's coming from, from the, the men. Women? It's coming from the men and coming from many women also, unfortunately. What was your experience as Deputy President? As Deputy President, I don't think there was an experience I would specify that I would say oh. faced me because of me being a woman. Sure. So I just did my work as it presented itself, and that was fine. I can't believe it's six o'clock. This is gone. <laughs> this is so unfair. Oh my goodness. Yo, mama. Closing words to everyone out there, every single South African who's listening and has been hanging on to your every word. I just want to say to South Africa that it was great uh, serving you. And I'm seriously honored. And I think, South Africa, there are many women leaders who are ready to serve you at the most uh, difficult office, because that office is not child's play, I must say, but women are ready. Women themselves are ready. It's the people that are not giving support to the leaders that are women that are ready to lead them. Thank you so much. And thank you for leading us. We were led and we will continue to be led. Thank you very much. SAFM.